Both of these are great examples of the wonderful handler community that we have in Basset Hound. If the tumor ruptures, it causes internal bleeding, a very severe emergency. Sir Everett Millis has been considered by many to be the father of the breed in England. If you're passionate about Basset Hounds, this podcast is for you. This is Wobegon, the Basset Hound Podcast. I'm your host, Don Bullock. This is episode seven. In this episode, I'd like to share the second part of Buddy's story. He was our first AKC champion. I'll also share the beginnings of our breed and a standard for our breed, a common and important health issue that especially occurs in older dogs and a question about getting a second Basset. Please let me know what you'd like me to talk about that's related to Basset Hounds. I'd like for this podcast to meet your needs, the needs of my listeners. Ask some questions that you'd like answers to about the breed. I'd like to hear from you. My email address is donbullock at wobegonbassets.com, or you can leave an audio question or an email question through our website, wobegonbassets.com. Comments can also be left in the YouTube version of this podcast. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. I'd like to remind everyone listening to the audio version of Wobegon, the Basset Hound podcast, that show notes, including photos for each episode, can be found on our website, wobegonbassets.com. In episode six, I started the story of our first AKC champion, Shoeflies Bud Light. In this episode, I'd like to continue that story. Buddy continued to be a wonderful companion to Chili and Sam. The three of them got along well together. That's one advantage of getting a well-bred Basset. Their breeders were well known for breeding Bassets with good temperaments. Here are the three of them dressed up at Christmas. Sam and Buddy had their Christmas Mickey Mouse ears on, and Chili, the blind Basset, is wearing brightly colored sunglasses. Now here's another photo I snapped one day. I think Pam had just opened the treat jar in the kitchen. <laughs> no, I don't recall which of the boys got there first. While we've always had dog toys available, not every one of our Bassets played with them. Buddy was one who loved to play with toys. He'd spread them all over the house. He was also the one who could sleep almost anywhere in the house. Every summer, Pam and I would visit my parents who had moved to Eugene, Oregon. Each year, we took one of our Bassets with us. We timed our trips so that we could attend the Basset Hound specialty shows that were held in Washington or Oregon every summer. One year we took Buddy because we planned to show him at the specialty show in Tacoma, Washington. That year we drove up to Washington by driving along the coast rather than the inland route. Whenever possible, we'd stop for walks on the beach. Buddy enjoyed playing on the beach. Those of you watching the video version can see some of the beautiful photos that we took of Buddy along the beach. The photos will also be in our show notes on the website. When we got to Tacoma, we realized that the walks on the beach had left a lot of sand in Buddy's coat. The day before the show, we found a local groomer to get Buddy ready for the show. She did a great job getting him cleaned up. The shows were a fun experience for all of us. Buddy placed in his class at all three of the shows and even was first place at the BHCA regional show on Sunday. I distinctly remember that judge at the BHCA regional. She really liked Buddy. Unfortunately, as she was going over Buddy in the winner's class, she felt underneath him and discovered a little twist that he had in his ribs. When she did that, she sort of let out of a grunt, like, ugh. It was a discovery of something she didn't like, I suppose. Needless to say, we didn't win that day, but it was close. Even though we didn't win, Pam took photos of us in a beautiful spot next to the showgrounds. 
One shows me stacking Buddy, and the other shows Buddy and me with me holding his ribbons. At a show in Long Beach, a top named Basset Hound breeder and exhibitor, Mimi Tysling, was there watching the Basset Hounds. Mimi had noticed I was struggling with Buddy, and afterwards she offered me some tips, even though she had no idea who I was. Mimi even got down on the floor with Buddy to show me what she was talking about. I must say her tips did help some, and I greatly appreciated her help. Not too long after that, at the Kennel Club of Beverly Hills show, this time at the Los Angeles Convention Center's North Hall, I was approached by another exhibitor, Butch Dixon. Butch was a good handler and often showed tailgate dogs. He came over to me as we left the ring and asked, What's wrong with this dog? Why isn't he winning? He went on to say that he saw some good qualities in Buddy and thought the judges were missing them because Buddy was misbehaving in the ring. Butch then proceeded to take Buddy to the sidewalk just outside a nearby door and I followed. Once outside, Butch got down and went over Buddy and stacked him. Butch then turned to me and said, this boy should be winning more. He showed me a few techniques, but it was Butch's words that helped the most. I was assured by someone I highly respected other than Sue that Buddy was worthy of that AKC championship. Both of these are great examples of the wonderful handler community that we have in Basset Hound. They show some of the camaraderie that we have in our breed that makes showing a Basset Hound fun. With Mimi's tips and Butch's affirmation of Buddy's qualities, I concentrated even more on showing Buddy. A few shows later, Buddy was now two and a half, we had a big breakthrough at the Malibu Kennel Club show under a well-known judge, Dr. Alvin Krauss. I have no idea what happened that day, but whatever it was, I was shocked. Buddy walked into the show ring and stacked perfectly. Not one foot even felt like it would move. I was astounded. We went around the ring and stacked again. I got the same result. Nothing moved. The judge proceeded to go over each dog and move them individually. Suddenly, it was our turn. Buddy stacked for Dr. Krause if he had been doing it for years. He just stood there as if he was a statue or frozen in place while Dr. Krause examined him. We moved as directed by Dr. Krause. Even Buddy's movement was better than usual. After all in Buddy's class had been examined and moved individually, he decided to move the whole group again and had us circle the ring. As we did, he pointed to Buddy and said, number one. I was shocked. I could see Pam was standing outside the ring. <laughs> she was shocked as well. Since we were the last class, all the other class winners joined Buddy and me in the ring. We all went around the ring, and when I stopped, I got down and stacked Buddy. Again, he stood perfectly for me. I remember for the first time showing Buddy, I was able to actually stare at the judge. The judge had us go around the ring again as a group. About halfway around the ring, he pointed to Buddy and said, winners. We'd suddenly won our first major at a dog show. Pam and I were thrilled. Buddy went on that day to be selected best of opposite sex to best of breed. Since this was our very first major, I still have the ribbons framed on the, and they're hanging on the wall in one of our rooms. After winning the major, Buddy continued to show well and won a couple more times, but eventually he did what we call minored out. That means he just needed a major, three more points from a major to win his AKC championship. We continued to enter Buddy and shows, but among our Basset Hound group, we had all agreed that if a dog was minored out like Buddy was, that we would not show our dogs unless a major was possible. There were a few shows with possible majors, but Buddy didn't win any of them, though he showed well for me. The year ended with no major wins. At the time in Southern California, one of the biggest dog show weekends started off the year. At all three shows, there was a major in bitches, that's the girls, not dogs or the boys. In order to win a major, Buddy would have to win winner's dog 
and go on as best of winners. I showed Buddy at the first two without winning. That left the Sunday Kennel Club of Palm Spring show. That day, the judge was Stephen D. Gladstone, a very well-known and prominent AKC judge at the time. He actually was the judge that gave Buddy his second win. Sue had shown to Mr. Gladstone numerous times in the past, it had been her observation and experience that he rarely put up dogs from the open class, which was the class I had to show Buddy in. Since Sue was Buddy's co-owner and breeder, she could show him in the bred by exhibitor class, so I asked Sue if she would do that. She quickly agreed to show Buddy that day. There was a little drama in the show that Sunday morning that may have kept us from showing Buddy or at least have prevented anyone from getting a major win. The day before, friend Worcester's bitch Gracie had finished her championship. Graciously, Fran decided to keep her out of the best of breed class and keep her in the regular classes so that we could possibly get a major win for either the girls or the boys that day. This is another reason our Basset Hound group is so wonderful. Fran knew that Buddy and others needed a major win, so she was willing to help out by preserving the possibility for someone else to get a major. We were all asked if it was okay for Gracie to remain in the classes. We knew it was possible that she might win again, but we all agreed that we'd take that chance and hopefully she wouldn't win. I won't go through all the showing details except to say that Buddy showed well for Sue. He won winner's dog for two points. For that needed major to finish his championship, Buddy had to be selected best of winners over Gracie, who won a winner's bitch again. Sue took Buddy into the best of breed competition along with all the champion Bassets and Gracie. After Mr. Gladstone had examined the champions, he had Buddy and Gracie go around the ring together. Then he asked for all the Bassets to circle the ring together a couple of times. Shortly into that second go around, Mr. Gladstone pointed to one of the champions saying, best of breed. Then he quickly turned to Buddy and said, best of winners. Then to another champion, he said, best of opposite sex. <laughs> Buddy had done it. Suffice it to say, we finished our first AKC champion that day at the Kennel Club of Palm Springs sh Sunday show. It was an amazing feeling. After all the struggles with Buddy, he'd finally come through for us. Sue and Andy were thrilled as well. <laughs> Breakfast on the way home was wonderful. Buddy gave us a second first in showing the very next show. He was selected best of breed. Now he'd done that before at a show where there were no champions entered in the show, so that wasn't it. By winning best of breed, that meant that I could take Buddy into the hound group ring and show him there. The group judge was one I remember showing Buddy to many years before. He had awarded Buddy fourth place out of four in his class and awarded Buddy's sister winner's bitch at the same show with me showing both of them. Needless to say, I was certainly wasn't expecting anything from this judge in the hound group, but we stayed for the hound group anyway. I have no idea what got into Buddy that day as we entered the hound group ring. He entered the ring like he owned it. Every chance Buddy got, he showed off for the judge. He was perfect in stacking every time and moved with confidence. It was as Buddy knew he was a champion. I distinctly remember the judge watching Buddy from across the ring while he was supposed to be watching another dog move. I noticed too that the judge looked at Buddy every chance he could. After the judge examined all the dogs, we were at that make or break point when the group judge either picks their group winners or they select dogs to make a cut. Buddy was frozen in his best stack that I've ever had. I watched as the judge pulled out dogs and lined them up across the middle of the ring. He pulled out a dog, a few dogs in front of me, and then, yes, oh my, he pointed to me and said, come on out, and then to the wire-haired dachshund that was two dogs behind me. I was stacking Buddy in the center of the ring along with six others who had made the cut. 
all the other dogs left the ring. After studying his cut of seven, the judge had all of us go around. Buddy was still full of energy and put on a good show. I then saw the judge point once, twice, and a third time. And then, to my total amazement, he pointed at us and said, Group four. We had just won our first group placement. In those days, it was very rare for a basset hound to make the cut in a group, much less place in a group. I watched as the other three exhibitors left the ring and noticed the rejection on their faces. These were top professional handlers who had just lost to an owner handled with a basset hound. What an experience that was. I had struggled with Buddy for so long, so to be finally rewarded with a group placement was just unbelievable. Sue had trouble believing it too when I called her afterwards. Obviously, she was thrilled as we were. I continued to show Buddy until we had our next puppy to show. He had numerous best of breed wins, but except for making the cut under the same judge at another show, we never repeated our success of that day. It's truly a memory that Pam and I treasure to this day. That group four ribbon is framed and hanging on the wall in our home, along with the ribbons from the first show win that Buddy had and his first major win. Buddy lived a good life with us. He had truly become my buddy. He was also successful in veteran sweepstakes after he turned six. I'll mention him in future episodes, especially when we get to our second attempt at breeding. Of all the Bassets we've had, Buddy is still one of our favorites. One day, our vet discovered that Buddy had a large tumor on his spleen that was about to burst. This is something that happens with dogs, especially as they age. Our vet explained that a tumor on a spleen like Buddy had eventually bursts and quickly results in the dog bleeding to death. He told us we could either wait for that to happen or decide to put Buddy down. He suggested that the latter would be much better for Buddy. Our vet also explained why surgery in Buddy's case wasn't an option in his opinion. A few days later, based on our veterinarian's information, rather than waiting for the tumor to burst, we had the vet put him down. It was a very sad day, but Pam and I have always done what our vets have suggested was best for the dog and not necessarily what was best for us. But he was 10. It was very difficult to go to the show the next day. Fortunately, we had great friends who helped comfort us. Another reason that Basset Hound owners, especially exhibitors and breeders, are a great group to be around. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who are wondering why Buddy wasn't part of that howling trio that we had, it's simple. He couldn't howl. When others howled, Buddy just raised his head and just <sighs> blew. That's all that happened. No, no sound came out. It was very funny to watch. I mentioned in Buddy's story that he had a tumor on his spleen. Splenic tumors are very common in dogs, especially as they grow older. The spleen plays a role in the dog's immune system. It helps the body fight off infection and produces certain types of white blood cells. It also produces and stores new red blood cells, plus removing old, worn out blood cells. The splenic tumor is made up of cells that form blood vessels, and as such, the tumor is often filled with large pockets of blood. It can be very delicate and easily rupture, either through a bump or trauma, or just through growth and stretching. If the tumor ruptures, it causes internal bleeding, a very severe emergency. Up to two-thirds of dogs with splenic masses have malignant tumors. The median survival times reported with surgery plus standard chemotherapy range between four to seven months, with about 10 to 15 percent alive at one year. Those are not good odds, folks. While some dogs have longer-term survival, most dogs develop cancerous nodules in the abdomen or lungs and eventually succumb to bleeding from those lesions. As it did with Buddy, a suspicion of a splenic mass may arise during a routine examination appointment. 
As your vet feels your dog's tummy, he might feel an enlarged spleen. Following a suspicion for a tumor, your vet may recommend an abdominal ultrasound to check for changes in the spleen as well as free fluid in the abdomen, which could suggest internal bleeding. They may also recommend a blood test, a clotting test, and may sample the fluid from your dog's abdomen. Signs of a splenic tumor can be very subtle. They could be changes such as abdominal distension, weight loss, reduced appetite, and weakness. But they can progress sometimes rapidly if the tumor ruptures causing internal bleeding. Severe signs can include pale gums, increased heart and breathing rate, sudden slowing down, collapse, or even sudden death. This is one of the reasons that the annual checkups are something I strongly recommend and perhaps even more often in older dogs. Buddy's tumor was discovered during one of those routine examinations. I'd like to remind everyone here that I'm not a veterinarian. The information I just gave is from some research that I've done on the topic. If you suspect a splenic tumor or any other kinds of problems with your dog, you need to consult your veterinarian. And if necessary, get a second opinion from another veterinarian if that's something that you wish to do. So what I gave, like I said, was just information that I found doing some research on my own from good, reliable sources. Your veterinarian is the best person to go to for your dog. You may recall that Lord Galway bred Basset and Bell, the first two Bassets in England. This mating produced a litter of five pups, but as there was no public exposure to them, very few people knew anything about them. It wasn't until 1874 when Sir Everett Millis imported the basset called Model from France did others become aware of the breed in England. Now for those of you that are watching the video version, this is a drawing of Model from the time. And you might notice that his ears were rather short compared to our Bassets today, but notice the structure. In the front, he has those massive paws and short legs that are heavily wrinkled. His chest is rather wide with a very prominent sternum sticking out front. Now, if we judged him based on modern standards, we would say his top line is a little high in the rear, but that was common in those days. That's partly because we don't see the same angulation in his rear legs that we see in modern bassets. Now here is an actual photograph of Model standing on a bench at a dog show. You can see here that the photo is a lot like the drawing that I showed earlier, except I think the ears look even shorter in the photo. For his support of the breed and breeding program within his own kennel, as well as cooperation with breeding programs established by Mr. George Cruel and Lord Onslow, who included Mr. Lord Galway's pack that he purchased, Sir Everett Millis has been considered by many to be the father of the breed in England. He first established Model as an English show dog in 1875, but it was not until he helped make a large entry for the Wolverhampton show in 1880 that a great deal of public attention was drawn to the breed. After showing Model at the Wolverhampton show, Millis wrote that having left his hound chained up at the dog show's venue, the Agricultural Hall, now I need to interject here that this was common practice at the time, so it wasn't unusual for him to do that. He went to the nearby Talbot Hotel where he was staying. After dining, he retired to the smoking room where several gentlemen were discussing the imminent show and the other canine matters. He reported the following conversation taking place. Showing terriers, he was asked by one of the men. Bulls, said another. No, Millis replied, a basset. A what, they said? A basset, Millis repeated. What's he like, asked another, winking to his companion. Oh, he's about four feet long and 12 inches high. Suddenly, many others, including members of the public, became aware of Bassets in England. Still at this time, there were no written breed standards. 
while there was a competition among the dogs at shows, the judging was based on just the thoughts of the judges. Those thoughts were obviously dependent on the experiences and knowledge of each of the judges. Most of the judges were somehow involved in hunting and breeding. As with judges today, their backgrounds made a big difference in their judging. In the book, Dogs and All About Them, published in 1934, it states, quote, As with most imported breeds, the Basset Hound, when first exhibited, was required to undergo a probationary period as a foreign dog in the variety class at the principal shows. It was not until 1880 that a class was provided for it by the Kennel Club, end quote. They were actually shown with all the various Basset breeds in one big class. The following is an excerpt from the chapter on Basset Hounds in Castle Hell's Illustrated Book of Dogs, published in 1881. This is perhaps the very first standard for Basset Hounds in England. I found this article because it was published in the New Book of Dogs, chapter 27, in 1907. The article states, quote, Perhaps the most explicit description of the perfect Basset Hound is still that compiled 25 years ago by Sir Edward Millis. It is at least sufficiently comprehensive and exact to serve as a guide, end quote. It's very interesting to compare what Everett Millis said back then to our current AKC standard. While the following was never an official standard for Bassets, it truly influenced those standards. Here's what Millis wrote. Quote, The Basset for its size has more bone perhaps than nearly any other dog. The skull should be peaked like that of a bloodhound, with the same dignity and expression. Nose black, although some of my own have white about theirs. And well flued. For the size of the hound, I think the teeth are extremely small. However, they are not intended to destroy life. This is probably the reason. The ears should hang like the bloodhounds and are like the softest velvet drapery. The eyes are deep brown and are brimful of affection and intelligence. They are pretty deeply set and should show a considerable haw. A basset is one of those hounds incapable of having a wicked eye. End quote. Here I need to interject some information. The Basset Hound ancestors at this time were divided into three different classes and are named after the crookedness of their forepaws. The names are as follows. The crooked leg Basset is a Jumbo Taurus. The half crooked leg Basset was the Basset Jumbo Demi Taurus. And the straight leg Basset was a Jumbo Doris. As I stated in episode six, these were all eventually combined into one modern Basset Hound and the varieties are now extinct. Now back to the description by Millis. Quote, the neck is long, but great power and the Basset Jumbo Torres, the flues extend nearly down to the chest. The chest is more expansive in the Basset than even the Bulldog and should the Basset Jumbo Torres not be more than two inches from the ground. In the case of the Bassus of Jumbo Demi Taurus and Jumbo Doris, being generally lighter, their chests do not, of course, come so low. The shoulders are of great power and terminate in the crooked feet of the Basset, which appear to be a mass of joints. The back and ribs are strong and the former of great length. The sterner tail is gaily carried like that of hounds in general, and when the hound is on scent of game, this portion of the body gets extremely animated. And tell me in my own hounds when they have struck a fresh or cold scent, and I even know when the foremost hound will give tongue, end quote. Now giving tongue means to bark. Back to the quote. The hindquarters are very strong and muscular, the muscle standed rigidly out down to the hocks. The skin is soft in the smooth-haired dogs and like that of any other hound, but in the rough variety, it's identical with that of the otter hounds. End quote. Again, I need to interject some information here. The rough coat basset referred to here is our modern griffon 
not the long-haired basset hounds as some think. As I mentioned before, all types of bassets, including basset griffon von D and dachshunds, were shown together in early shows. They were not separated out by breed as they are today. Now back to the description. Quote, Color, of course, is a matter of fancy, although I infinitely prefer the tricolor, which has a tan head and black and white body, end quote. This description, written by Millis, is not an official standard, but it served as a description of Bassett's for many years. The first AKC standard for Bassett Hounds wasn't officially accepted until 1955, and the current AKC standard was accepted by the AKC in 1964. I don't have any information on the Kennel Club FCI Basset Hound standard. The latest revision to that standard was made in 2023. More will be said on that in future podcasts. Now, I really feel like I'm getting ahead of myself here now and need to go back and tell you how we got to this particular point in the Basset Hound's history. There's a lot of confusion between the time that Lord Galway bred his Bassets and this particular point, but it's very interesting to see how we got to this point. So I'm going to go back in episode eight and cover more of what happened in Bassets for us to get to this particular point in the breed. My standard myth for this episode isn't actually a myth. It's more about something that's in the AKC standard that I think judges have forgotten. It's related to the front feet. I was reminded of it recently at a show when Pam was showing Emmy. While I stated in the episode on chili, just about every judge checks bites, there's something mentioned in the AKC standard for Basset Hounds that I rarely see checked by judges. Even judges who thoroughly go over the dogs seem to fail to check it. Can any of you who show Bassets figure out what it is? You can pause the podcast here if you want time to think. Here's a hint. The thing that judges rarely check is included in this quote from the AKC standard regarding the front paws. Quote, the paw is massive, very heavy with tough, heavy pads, well-rounded with both feet inclined equally a trifle outward, balancing the width of the shoulders. Feet down in the pasterns are a serious fault. The toes are neither pinched together or splayed, with the weight of the fourth part of the body borne evenly on each. The dew claws can be removed. End quote. Still no guesses? During the many years I've been going to dog shows and showing basset hounds, I've only noticed three judges who checked what I'm referring to. Two were judges from Europe, and more recently, a judge from the United States was one who checked it on Emmy. These three judges checked the pads of the front feet of basset hounds they judged. Going back to the quote from the standard, quote, the paw is massive with heavy pads. After judging was over, I mentioned this to the judge who checked Emmy's paw. His comment was, quote, Bassets are a hunting breed. The pads of the feet are important in hunting. Now I'm wondering, how many of you have had the pads of your basset checked by a judge or seen it done at a dog show? Have you perhaps noticed it being done often? Let me know. Perhaps my experience is unusual. I'd really like to know. Now, for those of you who would like to support the podcast, I've come up with some merchandise for you. You may remember the photo of Lexi begging. I've decided to turn that into some merchandise and added the words, wins dinner, in a font that reminds me of the old-fashioned diners. This graphic is available on t-shirts, I've chosen two different brands at two different price points for you to choose from. One has limited colors and the other one has a lot of different colors available. I've also added a white coffee mug for those of you that like to drink some hot liquids like coffee or tea as you listen to the podcast. You'll find links to the merchandise on our website at wobegonbassets.com. I greatly appreciate your support 
and appreciate the fact that you're listening to the podcast. And now back to the podcast and a listener's question. Now here's the listener question for this episode. I have a two-year-old girl basset hound. Do you think a male or female puppy for her to have a brother or sister would be better? Do you think two females get along better or a male and female? Which will get along the best and be there for each other most when we go to the store or they need to be home alone? Right now, my girl barks whenever I'm not home. End quote. This is a question that Pam and I get a lot. It appears in different forms, but is always worded similar to this question. It appears often in emails or people ask us at shows. The question was also often asked by people who were interested in getting a puppy from us as a companion to the Basset Hound they already had. First of all, as I've stated in previous episodes, Bassets were bred to live in packs. Now, I'm not an expert on what some refer to as pack dynamics. What I do know is that Basset Hounds like having other dogs around. As I mentioned with Buddy, they were even happier when they see other Bassets. Now, I can't say that what Bassets are like at home when they're alone. We've never really had that experience. We've always had several Bassets in our home. I have heard from many who have. While it's often fine to have just one Basset at home, some have reported like this lady that they think their Basset is lonely without another Basset. Many of them complained that their Bassets cried or barked a lot while they were gone, some to the point where neighbors complained. In all cases where we were able to provide people in this situation with a Basset Hound puppy, they reported back that their Basset was extremely happy with their new companion. In these situations, all the Bassets that people had were females, and the puppies we sold them were males. So based on our experience with our puppies, we would recommend that she get a male companion for her Basset Hound girl. But only if the girl has been spayed. Now, as someone who's had several males in our home at one time, I can say that we haven't had many problems with them. The only time we've had an issue is when we suddenly added a second female to our pack. The two males would occasionally decide to fight. It's something that Sue Shoemaker had warned us about, so we weren't surprised at what had happened. We ended up separating the two boys, and this fixed the problem. This is an unusual situation that most of you would never have. In most cases, having two males will work out very well, especially if they've been neutered. After getting that second female, we've always had several together in our home. I think the most females we've had at one time is five. We've not had any problems with our girls except for one. One of our girls, Bonnie, would occasionally let one of the other girls know she was the boss. I'll mention more about that when I get to her story, but it's something that you might want to be aware of. It wasn't a big problem and never caused anything close to a fight. As with the males, having two girls together isn't usually a problem. A couple of spayed females, which is usually the situation in most homes, would even be better than the situation we had with all our intact girls. Well, on several occasions, we did sell puppies to people who didn't have a dog. We always made sure that we picked out the puppy that we thought would like to live alone rather than one that seemed to be needy of other dogs being around them. So we were very careful in which puppy they were able to buy. In all, most cases, most of those people did not get another dog for their home, or at least for quite a while, and they reported that the puppy did very well. So we haven't had a whole lot of problems with this kind of issue with the homes where our puppies went. But I have heard that it is a big problem. I do strongly recommend that everybody have more than one dog at home if they have a Basset Hound. I hope you enjoyed Buddy's story in episode six and seven. He was an exceptional Basset that we were very fortunate to have. His story, as well as those of Chili and Sam together, show how difficult it can be to get an AKC champion. It's not as easy as some may think. 
That's one reason that AKC Champion dogs are so important. They're truly special. Comparing the description of Bassets written by Millis in 1881 to the current AKC standard for Basset Hounds is something I highly recommend. It's truly interesting comparison. Comparing it to the current FCI standard is interesting as well, but that standard has changed recently at least twice. I know it's the standard used in countries where many of you listen. I'll be saying more about it in the future. The dog quote for this episode is actually the title of a book by C.J. Frick. He said, be the person your dog thinks you are. As far as I'm concerned, that's great advice for all of us. His book is published by Macmillan. It's a fully illustrated book that shows us that even when we feel our worst, our dogs still think we are the best, so start acting like it. It's for dog owners and lovers everywhere. Now, before we wrap up this episode, I need to brag about Pam and our current showgirl, Emmy. Recently, they were awarded with a certificate for AKC Bronze Level for showing an owner-handled dog. The award is called the National Owner-Handled Series Bronze Level. In addition, Emmy was just rewarded with her Grand Championship Bronze Level Medallion and Certificate. This is for going beyond the regular AKC Grand Championship and is an actual title that could be added to the front of her name. I'm extremely proud of both Emmy and Pam. They have become a great team working together in the show ring. Please remember the thumbs up on YouTube version of the podcast and a high rating wherever you listen to podcasts. Both of those really help. I truly appreciate all of you who have recommended the podcast to other Basset Hound owners or fans of the breed. And remember, let me know if you've ever had a judge check the pads of your Basset's paws or have seen it happen in the ring. I'm interested in seeing if my experience with this is unusual. I'm also looking forward to hearing from you. You can leave comments on the YouTube version Send an audio message or an email message through our website, wobegonbassets.com, or just email me directly at donbullock at wobegonbassets.com. And thank you all very much for listening. Wobegon the Basset Hound podcast is published in visual form on YouTube the first Monday of every month. A full-length audio version of each episode is published one week later wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out our Wobegon Bassett's website for show notes including photos from every episode. You can also find links to the podcast plus information on Don and his wife Pam plus their Bassett hounds. Wobegon the Bassett Hound podcast is produced, researched, and hosted by Don Bullock. The music is Do Your Ears Hang Low played by Nasrality from the Philippines. It's available royalty-free on Pixabay. Please give this podcast a thumbs up on YouTube and a high rating wherever you listen to podcasts. Until next time, this is Don. Thank you very much for listening.